Okay, hi everyone, I am Judy Greenspan. I'm Director of Public Programs here at the Center for Jewish History. And I wanna thank all of you for coming tonight. Very happy to see such a big crowd and to welcome our terrific panel for tonight's discussion, Jews, Politics, and the 2018 midterm elections. So the program this evening is part of our series called History Matters, a series that strives to provide historical perspective to on today's big issues and events. One of the year's biggest, the midterm elections, is now just 12 days away. I know that's not news. And in this election, as in most, the Jewish vote, quote unquote, the Jewish vote, has once again been a subject of considerable speculation and media coverage. So if we look at historical voting patterns, and we will tonight, the speculation may seem unwarranted. After all, the majority of American Jews are Democrats and have been since the 1920s. A recent study summed up the close connection between American Jews and the Democratic Party like this. Quote, voting Democratic is often considered as central to the American Jewish inheritance as are an inspirational immigration story, silver candlesticks, and grandma's matzo ball soup. In a well-known story about his own family, Ari Fleischer also acknowledged this historical connection, but in a slightly different way. He said his parents were, his words, horrified when he became a Republican. And even while he was working for former President Bush, they often joked that being a Republican was a, quote, phase he would grow out of. <laughs> But as ongoing speculation about the Jewish vote might imply, American Jews, while strongly democratic, do not, of course, vote in lockstep, and I would say neither do Democrats. And what factors have, tr what factors have triggered variations in Jewish voting patterns in previous elections? What issues motivate, unify, and divide Jewish voters now? And as we navigate today's shifting political landscape, can we look to a helpful roadmap from the past? I'm looking forward to hearing what our panelists have to say about these questions and more. But before I introduce everyone, I'd like to share a few words about the Center for Jewish History. Understanding how the past informs the present is central to our mission here. The Center is a world-renowned research institute for scholars of Jewish history, a destination for public programs and exhibitions, a place to explore your family tree, and most importantly, the center is home to our five partner organizations and their extraordinary archives. Our partners, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, together possess a treasure trove of historical artifacts, documents, books, recordings, films, and photographs that span hundreds of years of history and make up the largest repository of Jewish archival material outside of Israel. And it's possible to walk past this building as many people do and not actually know that. So relative to tonight's program, here's a very small sample of the kinds of materials you can find when coming here or going online to research the history of the Jewish vote. So let's see if I can do this. Good. So, for example, from the Yivo Library, there are books like this one, The Intelligent Voter's Guide, the official 1928 campaign handbook of the Socialist Party. We actually found quite a lot on socialism, which is interesting, of course. From the digital archives of the American Jewish Historical Society, here's a photo taken almost exactly 85 years ago to the day, on October 28, 1933, Socialist Party sign on Delancey Street on the Lower East Side. And one of my favorites, something some of you here may remember, <laughs> from the Yeshiva University Museum collections. And I would like to know, does anybody remember this pin? All right, so I don't either actually. Yeah, Nixon, Nixon. So the treasures in our archives are not actually meant to be hidden away, nor are they. And we encourage you to visit our reading room and make use of our online resources. So each of our panelists tonight also brings a wealth of information and a variety of perspectives to tonight's topic. Clyde Haberman, who's right here, and his numerous credentials are listed more completely in your program as our moderator tonight, and we're very, very pleased that he's here. 
well known to readers of the New York Times. And is there anyone here who does not, has not heard of Clyde Haberman in our, yeah, I think we're all New York Times readers. <laughs> Clyde was a reporter, bureau chief, foreign correspondent, and columnist during his 37 year career at the paper. Since 2014, he has written a regular Times column accompanying retro re report, a series of document video documentaries that explore major news stories of the past and their continuing resonance today. He is the winner of many journalism awards, including a Pulitzer Prize. And among his many professional accolades are online comments from appreciative readers, like this one who posted, quote, I can't count the number of times I've asked a friend, did you read Clyde Haberman this morning? <laughs> so introducing the rest of our, our panels from alphabetically, we are starting um, all the way to my left. Um, uh, Rabbi Jill Jacobs is the executive director of TRUA, the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights, an organization which mobilizes more than 2,000 rabbis and cantors and tens of thousands of American Jews to protect human rights in North America and Israel. Widely regarded as a leading voice on Jewish social justice, Rabbi Jacobs is also the recipient of numerous awards. Among them, she was named to the forwards list of 50 influential American Jews three times, to Newsweek's list of the 50 most influential, influential rabbis in America, and to the Jerusalem Post 2013 list of women to watch. Next to Rabbi Jacobs is Jeff Jacoby, also a newspaper man. He's an award-winning op-ed columnist for the Boston Globe and a nationally recognized conservative voice. In 1999, Jeff became the first recipient of the Brindell, is that Brindell Prize, a major award for excellence in opinion journalism. And among his other awards, he was included in the Forward 50, a list of the 50 most influential American Jews in 2014. Next to Jeff, we have Haley Seufer, who joins us tonight from Washington, DC, where she is the first executive director of the Jewish Democratic Council of America. She also oversees the Jewish Electorate Institute, founded to examine Jewish voting patterns through a nonpartisan lens. Haley is a seasoned congressional aide, an Obama administration alum, and a foreign policy expert with a long record of, of working, working on issues of importance to the Jewish community and of concern to Jewish voters. For the past 16 years, she has served in various national security roles, supporting Democrats in the US Senate, House, and executive branch. And finally, our historian tonight, Professor Julian Zelizer. He is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University and a CNN political analyst. This year, Professor Zelizer is also the Distinguished Senior Fellow at the New York Historical Society, where he's working on a biography of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel for the Jewish Live series at Yale University. He is the author and editor of 19 books on American politics and has published over 800 op-eds. His next book, Fault Lines, The History of Divided America um, Since 1974, co-authored with Kevin Cruz, will be published this January. So you can read more. That's just sort of tidbits, highlights. So you can read more in your handouts. And at the conclusion of the discussion, we will have time for Q&A from the audience and after the program, I hope you will join us in the Great Hall for a reception. And now, Clyde Haberman and our panel. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? I'm not sure. This is working good. Uh, and thank you very much, Judy. It's the first time in a long time I've been identified as anything other than Maggie Haberman's father. So uh, uh, nice, nice to know. Um, Let's cut to the chase. Uh, of course, for most Jews, there's nothing more important than Jews. But in, electorally speaking, in this midterm elections, how important is the Jewish vote? Are there places, and I know you've done surveys on this, Haley, for the uh, Jewish Electorate Institute. Uh, are there parts of the country, races, maybe Florida, maybe Nevada, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, where indeed this small segment of the population will make a difference? Or are we more fascinated with ourselves than others electorally warranted? Sure, so I, I will take it. Sure. Uh, well, well, thank jump you. Jump in, everybody, of course. 
Thank you so much. Uh, so the answer is that the Jewish vote definitely matters. And in 2018, that is uh, perhaps even more so than we've seen in the past. This election is going to be determined by a very narrow margin in many areas where we see a Jewish population that could actually make the difference. And that is what our organization, the Jewish Democratic Council of America, is focused on in terms of getting out the Democratic vote. But if you look at some of the races in terms of the areas where the 23 seats are that will determine control of the House, uh, those are areas where there is a large Jewish population. And given the fact that our country is so divided between red and blue, we know that this election will be determined by the purple in between, by potentially independent voters, but certainly by getting out the vote on both sides. And ultimately, we believe that the races will come down, again, to a very narrow margin. So while the Jewish population is only 2% of the population as a whole, we know that we do vote. We're a very important part of the electorate. And areas where the concentration of the Jewish population is largest are also very clearly aligned with those races for both the House and the Senate that matter in terms of the 2018 election. I wonder, though, is it, is it the case that in those districts, maybe those states even, where the Jewish vote is noteworthy, that there's a question about how the Jewish vote will break down, in which case how Jews vote may well determine the outcome of some of these elections? Or would it be fair to say that Jews are likely to vote in those districts more or less the way they vote in those districts four years ago, in which case it probably wouldn't give us reason to think that there's going to be a big difference depending on what Jews do? Sure. Well, of course, we've looked at that very question. And uh, we, we, uh, the Jewish Electorate Institute recently commissioned a poll. Uh, it's a nonpartisan organization that commissioned a poll, looked at 800 Jewish voters from across the country to understand the breakdown, both in terms of partisan affiliation and how voters will vote in this election. And the results of the poll were very clear. Overwhelmingly, Jews support Democrats. Uh, the poll showed 68%, which is, about, which is consistent, uh, and consider themselves Democrats. But 74% of those polled, so more than those who identify as Democrats, are going to vote for Democrats in this election. And we believe that that difference can be attributed to the fact that the Jewish community very strongly believes that this administration and the Republicans who uh, have been silent or complicit in enacting the policies of this administration um, are really advocating for policies that are antithetical to Jewish values. So the vote matters, and we believe that not just those who have historically aligned as Democrats, but even more so, Jews who may consider themselves independents will overwhelmingly support Democrats in this election because they are so opposed to the policies of this administration. I think Julian wants to Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it's going to be two ways in which it matters. One is a, a Nate Silver kind of way in terms of uh, here's a population that tends to be small but concentrated and turn out. And can they swing a midterm, which is going to hinge on very competitive races? So in a state like Florida, even, uh, you could imagine the, the concentration in a race that's going to be determined by a handful of, not a handful of votes, but tens of thousands of votes can affect the senatorial uh, election. So in that way, it's going to matter. It's still matter. It's a turnout uh, contest. That's what midterms are. So this does matter. And then there's a whole other way in which it's an interesting uh, uh, part of the population to watch. It's what does President Trump do to the political identity of voters? Is partisanship stronger uh, in the end than some of the ways in which he might be changing sentiment in both parties? So there's all this speculation that some Democrats are going to shift to the GOP because of President Trump and his policies on Israel. Is that really true? Is it possible to break what has been a traditionally democratic constituency? Uh, and similarly, will this affect conservative Republicans uh, who have often been very critical of what the president is doing and standing for? Or does their vote remain exactly the same come election day, regardless of what they say? So it's a good prism through which to see this question of does Trump really transform the basic partisan dynamics that we've now seen for a couple decades. Jill, any thoughts on that? I'll just add. It works. Good. 
I'll just add that I mean, Haley brings all the statistics which show really clearly that, that Jews are overwhelmingly going to vote Democratic in this election and, as you said, that the vote matters. One of the ways that we can also see that the vote matters is that Jews are a subject of discussion in this election. We've certainly seen that in Florida where the Republican candidate has been trying to accuse the Democratic candidate of um, falsely of anti-Semitism in order to swing the Jewish vote. And so if Jews didn't matter, then that wouldn't be something that that candidate would be trying to do. And we also see that as the election heats up, that there is a rise in anti-Semitism. There's been a rise in anti-Semitism, invisible anti-Semitism in this country over the last couple of years, but we see more and more the language about Soros and other Jews trying to buy the country, trying to buy the election. We see an increase in the in the anti-Semitic flyers that are appearing in different communities. And so we see that, in fact, Jews, even though we're just 2% of the population, have become a subject, an object in, in this election, perhaps certainly more than a few years ago. And to throw it out to all of you, how, how large for Jewish voters does Israel loom uh, at this point? And is there a generational divide in how large Israel looms, uh, if at all. Obviously, uh, many people will be affected by the fact that uh, under Trump, uh, the US Embassy has been moved to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. Uh, uh, many, maybe most, would applaud that. Some might not. But is it really what is guiding increasingly uh, Jewish voters and increasingly younger Jewish voters? I think it depends which Jewish voters you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, OK. So uh, break it down. Who? who the more my bubby would uh, vote differently from uh, my children. Okay, perhaps. so um, for more orthodox, relig religiously orthodox Jews, uh, a much greater likelihood of voting Republican. Um, for more uh, Reform Jews, which is of course the dominant uh, segment of the of the Jewish community, a much more much greater likelihood of voting uh, Democrat. But again, how does Israel? and U.S. policies toward Israel and Israel's very conservative government and the lack of any progress uh, on the, uh, uh, the peace front with the Palestinians my, without assigning blame necessarily. No, 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 I hear, I hear but, my my but, sense is that for older Jews and for Jews who are more, tend to be more orthodox, more, I don't want to say religious, but more observant, more traditional, Israel looms much larger uh -huh. as an issue. Uh, you asked also if there might be a generational divide, and I think there's all kinds of evidence that that is the case, that there's a weaker connection between many younger American Jews and Israel. Um, uh, I, I don't think that anyone who voted Republican or who voted for Trump with Israel in mind is a vote that will have been lost in right. the two years since then. The question is how many might be peeled off, and that depends on how much other stuff that Trump has done uh, you know, that, might, that might turn off uh, Jews who otherwise would be voting. There are fewer and fewer Jew Jewish voters for whom Israel is the single issue. For those Jews for whom that is a big issue, uh, support for Israel uh, is perceived, uh, with, all, with all respect to Haley's numbers, as being far more dominant on the right. Uh, the, the polls have been showing for 20, 25 years now that support for Israel is stronger and stronger and stronger among Republicans and among conservatives, and it's getting slowly weaker and weaker among Democrats and among liberals. Obviously, many exceptions to, you know, to any of these rules of thumb. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I remember in the fall of 2015, maybe the beginning of the winter, November, December of 2015, talking with someone who was working for one of the Republican candidates, not Donald Trump, uh, in New Hampshire. You know, in New Hampshire, every, every four years, there's the long buildup to the New Hampshire primary, and all the candidates who want to try out spend time there. And I was talking with one candidate for, one, one staffer for a Republican candidate, um, who said to me, there is not, and he had been going to many of the events that, that the different Republican uh, wannabes were, were holding. He said, there is nothing that any Republican candidate can say to any Republican audience in New Hampshire that gets more applause than a statement of strong support for Israel. Oh. Not a Jewish audience, not, you know, not, not specifically focused on, on, on Jewish voters. Nothing was getting bigger applause, he said. He was amazed, as, as amazed to, to see that as I was to hear him say that. Uh, there is now overwhelming support for Israel for whatever reason we can, we can talk about among the, the more Republican, the more conservative the voter, uh, the, the stronger the support for Israel. Right. Uh, that's got to have some effect. Let's get some. 
I think actually slides. Haley should speak because you have okay. some really interesting polling numbers. Yes, I mean, this is something where uh, we really wanted to better understand this issue in terms of the prioritization of issues uh, for Jewish voters when they go to the polls. And while 92% of those polled in this recent poll, and it was just done earlier this month, so this is very new data, said that they consider themselves pro-Israel, Israel was not one of the top issues that determined their vote. The top issues are domestic issues. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, we, we recently witnessed in our country uh, a very divisive Supreme Court nomination process. So, of course, that was front and center for people. But other domestic issues, such as access to affordable health care, uh, the economy, Medicare, Social Security, were overwhelmingly the top priorities in terms of how Jews will decide to vote. In addition, issues like immigration, so that look at values in terms of where, where we've been, where we come from, and how we see the world, and whether we will support uh, an administration who tears parents apart from their children at the border. So those kind of values-driven issues are determining to some degree, to a large degree, the Jewish vote. In addition, uh, Jews, by an overwhelming margin, 64%, view the Democratic Party as pro-Israel. So while it's an important issue for Jews, it is one that is satisfied largely by many, the majority of the candidates running. So it really has not become an issue in this election that will necessarily determine the vote. This vote will be decided by domestic policy issues and the issues facing our country currently. One of the, something that I thought was really interesting in that poll was that an overwhelming majority of Jews, was it 92% said that they're, they support Israel, they're pro-Israel. And more than half of Jews said that they are critical of the current Israeli government, which seems obvious. I'm pro-America and I'm critical of the current American administration. And it makes sense that one can be pro-Israel and be critical of what is the most right-wing government that Israel has ever had. So that seems completely obvious, and yet you were some of the first to ask the question. Usually the question gets asked, are you pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian, as though it's a zero-sum game, and you have to pick, and then people make lots of assumptions based on those answers, whereas you get much better data when you start to dig into, well, what does it actually mean to be pro-Israel? Does that, can we decouple being pro-Israel with being pro-Netanyahu government, which if it seems really obvious. And we know when we look at polling that the majority of American Jews are still supportive of a two-state solution, are uh, against settlements, are, want human rights for both Israelis and Palestinians. And even though it's true that many of the more um, small C conservative Jews, largely in the Orthodox community, but also elsewhere, see President, Trump, President Trump's um, support of anything that Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to do, they equate that with being pro-Israel. Actually, the majority of Jews disapprove of how President Trump is handling Middle East policy and understand that not only is he moving us farther and farther away from any kind of peace agreement, but also that within his administration there's just a basic lack of understanding of the dynamics of the region and therefore he's putting both Israelis and Palestinians in greater danger. And most Jews understand that and that doesn't mean that, that doesn't at all mean that one is less pro-Israel if one doesn't support the way that Trump or Netanyahu are acting. In fact, I would argue that it's in fact more pro-Israel. I don't think, can I just jump in? I mean, I, I, my, answer, my answer is I don't think uh, it will have an effect. This is a perpetual puzzle in, uh, in American politics since, since Nixon in 72, actually, where he gets a higher percentage of the Jewish vote than Reagan in 1980. And the only time you really get that is when there's such a landslide uh, defeat for the Democrat that some of the minority of Jews, that number goes up. Uh, but it's pretty clear to me uh, that uh, the pattern remains. We saw it in 2004. We saw it in 2012 where this question was asked. The Democrat was painted as weaker on Israel and it didn't have an effect. 
uh, didn't have an effect in 2016 when Hillary Clinton still did well with the Jewish vote. So, uh, and, what do you and mean it, it, it didn't have an effect? What were Obama's Jewish numbers in 2008? Yeah, but what, what were her, were her numbers? She had over 70% of the Jewish vote. So she did quite well against no, Trump. No, no, I'm, I'm asking you to compare 2008, Obama I, won, and yeah. 2012. Obama's second term, his Jewish numbers went down. Yeah, but they went down to still a clear majority. So the, the, the numbers have not gone under, even with Reagan, when he did the best of all the presidents. And if there is any president who has done more uh, to alienate the Jewish vote, it's hard to think of anyone but Donald Trump. And he has trafficked in anti-Semitism. He has played with extremist groups in his rhetoric, in his Twitter account. And he has supported policies which go against what many Jews consistently show are priorities in the polls. So it's hard for me to imagine that there's going to be a huge break either in the midterm or 2020 because of the decision on Jerusalem uh, that all of a sudden you'll see a sea change. I think it goes against the history and it goes against him in particular. Okay, well, you're mentioning uh, about. Trump and, and attitudes toward him uh, actually leads to where I was going for my next question, which is, um, and Jill, you referred to growing anti-Semitism. From uh, which side, or is it both sides, to, to be simplistic about left and right, should one worry Trump is now calling himself uh, a nationalist, uh, rather, rather firmly the other day at a campaign rally. Uh, experience shows that uh, nationalism is usually bad for the Jews. Uh, Plain and simple. Uh, and um, you had the Charlottesville March, of course, last year, and the and, you know, Jews will not replace us. I didn't even know what the hell that meant, but there was a chant. Uh, on the other hand, on the left, we've seen the rise of um, particularly Democratic candidates, like here in New York City, uh, Alexandria uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, thank you, uh, for Congress. We've had uh, Ilhan Omar in Minneapolis also running for Congress. Ditto uh, Rashid uh, Tlaib in Detroit. Uh, at the least, uh, these folks would be considered hostile uh, toward Israel and maybe in some cases toward Jews in general. Uh, um, so how much of a threat is there from the left and the right? And um, Jeff, maybe I'll start with you because in 2009, you wrote that, uh, quote, on the right, hostility toward Jews has been anathemized, uh, leaving aside maybe a grammatical dispute I'd have with you about turning anathema into a word, uh, a verb. Uh, um, uh, we can do that later. Talk uh, to the master. No, nah, no master. But, and it, no, but seriously, I mean, would you still write that sentence today? Uh, let, me, let me give you a slightly roundabout answer. In 2016, in the run-up to that election, uh, I would tell Jewish audiences when I spoke with them that I wasn't going to vote for either of the two major party candidates. I'm, my politics are decidedly conservative, but I am definitely not a Republican, and I'm very definitely not a Democrat. Uh, and I, I decided that I was going to vote for one of the third party candidates, and I ended up voting for Gary Johnson, the Libertarian. I didn't like either Trump or Hillary Clinton, but I had different concerns about them. I also had overlapping concerns. I, I didn't think either one of them was a particularly honest person. A per, I didn't think either one of them had particularly high levels of integrity. But on Jewish, quote unquote, uh, issues, my great concern if Hillary Clinton were elected, and I said it over and over again, and probably wrote it in several columns at the time, is that US-Israel relations would get even more strained than they had gotten uh, during the Obama administration. And I feared what would happen uh, in, the, in the Democratic Party with such a strong and growing anti-Israel minority but growing anti-Israel minority uh, in, a, in a democratic administration. On the other hand, I said, I'm really worried about these snakes that are being, that are slithering out from under some of the rocks that the Trump administration, that, that the Trump campaign has been rolling over. Uh, and, and after years of saying and believing and, and being absolutely convinced uh, that anti-Semitism was no longer a concern in the United States in any realistic way. I said, my great fear in the Trump administration is that we will see a revival of, of an anti-Semitism that most of us would have thought was, was dead and gone. And have we? Um, what you've seen, at least what I have seen, is um, I wouldn't say that there's been any normalizing of anti-Semitism in the Republican Party. 
uh, David Duke is still as anathematized uh, <laughs> as he ever was. Uh, an endorsement from David Duke is not going to sway, it's not going to move uh, you know, anybody's votes. Um, you know, the Jews will not replace us at that, at that uh, uh, Charlottesville, at the Charlottesville uh, demonstration. Um, stuff like that um, nauseated a lot of people, particularly Republicans, or I would say as, as much nauseated Republicans as much as it would mainstream Republicans as much as it would mainstream Democrats. That said, there is this nasty, alt-right, hostile to Jews, hostile to Israel fringe, which is making its home in the Trumpified Republican Party. Um, for me, that's one more reason not to vote for, for Trump. Um, I, I would still maintain that in the mainstream, among mainstream conservatives, the mainstream Republican Party, anti-Semitism has no purchase. It is still the case that among mainstream conservatives, the mainstream Republican Party, uh, you will never, you, won't, you don't see any, any, um, any candidates likely to get elected to Congress. There are a couple of, of cranks who are running, but none that are likely to win who are as hostile to Israel as Tlaib or Omar are. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not concerned about what has happened yet, but if the last few years have taught all of us anything, it's that it's what, what we believe to be you know, new axioms that, would, uh, that weren't gonna change uh, turn out sometimes to be built right. on sand and can change quicker than we think. Let's move to the left here. <laughs> Well, I worry, I certainly worry about anti-Semitism, both on the right and the left. I have to say that I also, a few years ago, would have said, yeah, there's anti-Semitic incidents here and there, but it's not really a huge concern. I've spent much of the last two years speaking about anti-Semitism, training rabbis on how to deal with anti-Semitism, campus rabbis, rabbis in congregations, explaining and re-explaining and finding, and finding new ways to understand anti-Semitism, which I never ever would have predicted if you had asked me five years ago if I would have spent two years talking about anti-Semitism all the time, I would have laughed at you. Joe, can so, I add, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt, but just to add to, to the conversation, I was gonna to get to this later, but this is a good point to do it. Uh, um, to what degree, you talk about on campuses, for example, to what degree is a legitimate uh, criticism and attacks even on mm -hmm. Israel and to some degree uh, personified by the BDS movement, to what degree is legitimate anti-Israel sentiment, or at least, again, heavy criticism of this particular government, indistinguishable from anti-Semitism? Okay, Where does so it I'm gonna, let, me, let me get there. Okay. I, I'm gonna get there, Sorry. but I wanna... Okay. Um, so I am I'm worried on the right and the left. I'm worried more about the right because right now they have access to power and are being enabled by the President of the United States who has allowed the white nationalists and the alt-right and the, all of the um, extremist anti-Semites who maybe were talking among themselves on uh, 4chan or wherever before, but now they've been allowed to come out from, um, from under their rocks and, and be in public and be proud of who they are. And we see not only did the president call himself a nationalist, but a sentence later, he talked about the globalists, uh -huh. which is um, not really very coded language right. for uh, many or most of the people in this room. And so I worry about that. And one of the, something that I also worry about is that Jews have learned through history that when there's an economic crisis, people turn and look, and look for who to blame. And if and when, the economy turns into a crisis, then there are some very clear Jews who are very prominent in the administration, whether it's Mnuchin or Kushner. Um, Cohn got himself out of there, and I think there's probably a few others that I'm not thinking of. And they are likely to be the ones who people look at as, as the ones to blame. Or right now we're seeing a lot of the uh, an classic anti-Semitic imagery directed towards Soros. The classic right. idea that Jews are behind all of the progressive movements. The you know, extremely racist and xenophobic idea that um, people of color and immigrants aren't capable of running their own movement, so it must be the Jews or the puppet masters. So that's a very um, classic idea in among white nationalists. The Jews are behind everything. My friend Eric Ward, who wrote an extremely important 
article on anti-Semitism that you should look up called Skin in the Game, um, who himself is an African-American organizer who spent a lot of time working on white nationalism, said that what surprised him when he first got involved with um, researching and, and organizing around white nationalist groups in, in Oregon was he said, you know, they all had different ideas about race and immigrants and all sorts of things, but what they all had in common was anti-Semitism. And he had never previously thought about anti-Semitism. He's not Jewish, and, and suddenly he realized that he had to think about it. And so that is extremely troubling. On the left, there, it is clear that there's a point at which criticism of Israel sometimes, and even, that sometimes turns into anti-Semitism. And um, I have a piece that you can also Google in the Washington Post that tries to lay out the very specific places where that crosses the line, and places in which criticism of a government, which you can criticize any government you want. We all should be criticizing lots and lots of governments. Um, and international human rights, the whole idea of international human rights is that what happens in any given country is not just the business of that country, that every country has certain international obligations and also that all of us should be concerned with what happens in other countries. But there are certain places in which classic anti-Semitic imagery is used to describe Israel or in which there is um, a sense that there's, there's a lack of concern for Israelis or what might happen to Israelis. So you can have lots of positions about what the final, the, what the, the agreement should look like in the Middle East, but if you actually don't care about potentially creating a refugee crisis of six million Israeli Jews, then I would say that you're probably an anti-Semite. But if you're saying, but, that, but there are people who will say, well, I think there should be one democratic state in which everybody has a vote. Now, I don't think that that's actually possible, but I think it's possible to argue that without being an anti-Semite. Right. So, but I, I'll just say one more thing. I think in the Jewish community, we have to be crystal clear about making the distinction between what is criticism, even harsh criticism of Israel, and what's actually anti-Semitism, because when we blur the lines, it allows people to say, oh, well, you say that all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, so I'm gonna say that no criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. I think, I mean, for me, uh, it, it's, oh, I'm sorry, you can go. No, 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 it's, I, 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 it, it, it's not equivalent, and uh, even if we took on face value that the three candidates you mentioned are anti or ex exhibit. There are others, but. Uh, no, I, I know, but still, we're talking president versus some uh, candidates. We're talking about problems in the White House and not simply uh, rocks, uh, rolling over rocks, having people in high level appointments uh, who have very clear connections with these groups. That's, that's, that's a different story that we've seen. Uh, and, and the rhetoric that the president himself uses, he said he didn't know what white nationalism was the other day. Like, come on. I mean, we, we know that's simply not true. We could just call him out on that. Uh, it's been something different. We haven't seen an equivalent uh, um, example of that in the Democratic Party yet. That doesn't mean there's not anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party, that there's not anti-Semitism in progressive uh, movements. I'm sure it's there. I believe you have to distinguish uh, not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Uh, and I, I really do think that's important because the Democratic Party now is undergoing, I think, and will undergo more, more of a debate with the generational change uh, as well as the changes in Israeli policy. But, but I, I don't think we're in an equivalent moment right now. And um, I think the Republican Party's really changed. I, I'm not sure what mainstream Republicans are anymore. Uh, only in that, at, at a certain level, you own your president, uh, if, if the president is of, of your party, and, and you own certain members of Congress and the leadership who are very supportive of the president, so that he is mainstream Republican uh, party politics right now. And I think we can't keep separating the two. I, I will pick up on that. Uh, I completely agree that uh, the Republicans, some may want to disassociate themselves from the president, but the fact of the matter is that he has hijacked that party, and he is seen as uh, an ally of racists, of white nationalists, of white supremacists, of neo-Nazis, of Holocaust deniers, and there are no less than nine of them running for office in this election. In addition, it's important to note they're all running as Republicans. We don't talk about that very often. We talk about the three candidates that you mentioned whose views on Israel our organization has publicly denounced. However, the fact that there are nine candidates running 
who are associated or sympathetic to those movements. Again, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, Holocaust deniers. In addition, there are members of Congress who have allied themselves. Dana Rohrbacher in California's 48th okay. district is aligned with, is a known Holocaust denier. So the fact of the matter is, this, these movements have been legitimized by this president. And while in the past we may have seen, these people didn't come out of nowhere, they've always existed, but they weren't viewed as legitimate enough to run for Congress. Now they feel emboldened, now they feel legitimized, and that's because they believe they have an ally in the White House. And Haley, in all those cases, and you, I'm sure you know them a whole lot better than I do, my understanding is that in all those cases, these are candidates who essentially you know, grabbed onto a, a Republican nomination in a race where no one else was contesting. And several of them will stand no chance of winning, like the yeah, guy, because near, was, because guy in they Chicago or near Chicago whose name I'm blanking on. So, so there are some candidates who, who may not win. The fact of the matter is we have seen an unprecedented number of neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and Holocaust deniers feel legitimized to the point where they now are running for Congress. That in and of itself is alarming, and it should be alarming for all Jews. But we also have members of Congress who themselves are aligned with these movements as well, Steve King as well. Uh, there are sitting members of Congress who are aligned. And the fact of the matter is we have a president who just this week, as we noted, identified himself as a nationalist. We, we, are, we as a Jewish community should be alarmed because it's not that anti-Semitism hasn't existed in the past, but the fact of the matter is that in the views of many, including anti-Semites themselves, they have an ally in the president. So you know, let me we should ask say nationalism in and of itself is not a dirty word. It certainly is a, a, a word with you know, serious philosophical meaning. A, a, a book published just in the last couple of months by Yom Chazoni, who is a you know, prominent right of center, but extremely respectable and thoughtful Israeli intellectual called, well, I think it's called The Virtue of Nationalism, in which he makes the case that nationalism historically understood has been a bulwark of liberty. Uh, uh, in and of itself, the word... It may not be... Not that's not how the president it may not be dirty, the president but it's acknowledged that he shouldn't identify uh, himself as a nationalist uh, as he said it. So clearly he was told, well, this is the, the best thing to say, and he said it that, anyway. It has well, historic connotations, obviously. And so let me ask, then, uh, a, this question point blank. Uh, is Donald Trump an anti-Semite? Uh, uh, yes, he has. Yes, he has a. Uh, well, fair. It's a. It's a question I don't, anyway. I don't how do think we? So. Well, how do we? Uh, no. On the one hand, yes, he's got a, a Jewish son-in-law, and a, a now Jewish daughter, and 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 he's moved the embassy in uh, in Israel. Uh, on the other hand, everything that has been said here, including. That campaign, you know, speaking before Republican Jews and basically saying, you know, you guys are good with money, just like me. Uh, you make deals. Uh, it was going to every single uh, stereotype of the uh, uh, the Jew with the grasping hands. The ad, which showed Hillary with a cascade of dollars coming over her and pictures of Lloyd Blankfein, George Soros. Janet Yellen, uh, and, and of course, the Star of David, which he insisted was a sheriff's badge. Uh, uh, what, what is one to make of this guy? Well, Clyde, let me ask you. Wouldn't you say that there is a difference, and I, and I repeat, I am no supporter of Donald Trump. I think I, he's a I, bore, I, I think he's a bully. I understand and I, and I can't that. stand the man. I understand. I'm, but but I'm, at, the I, same time, at the same time, I don't want to unfairly invoke the term anti-Semite. But that's why I'm asking it as a question. So, May, might one do that? And frankly, I would even extend it to some of the Jews who he surrounded himself with. It really, I'll confess, bothered me that uh, Gary Cohn was very troubled by Charlottesville uh, and came close, he said, to resigning. But he didn't resign. When he did resign, it was over tariffs. And to me, it was, oh my god, it's, it's the, again, buying into the stereotype. Oh, it was the money issue that got you uh, that was the bridge too far, not these uh, uh, neo-Nazis. You know, do you remember the story a few months ago about, I think it was a councilman in D.C., uh, a, a Democrat, who made some kind of comment about um, the weather is controlled by, by the Rothschilds. Do you remember that story? Everybody saw yeah. that? Yeah. Would you say... You mean it's not? <laughs> 
I wouldn't say, uh, no, come on. I, I, I'm kidding. You know, we all got a good laugh at it, and there was plenty of mockery of right. this guy, and, you know, and he only compounded things when he was taken on a tour of the Holocaust Museum uh, you know, and walked out halfway through because he was bored. And yet, I wouldn't say that he was an anti-Semite in the sense of someone who actively dislikes Jews. I looked at that guy, and all I know is what I, you know, what I was reading at the time. He just struck me as someone who was an ignoramus. And I think that but he's not the pre uh, but we have a president. I understand. I understand. I don't, I don't, and, I, and Julie made the point before, and I don't minimize the difference, the, the impact of having a president on any issue. I understand all that. My point is just when we talk about anti-Semites, when we talk as Jews or as friends of Jews or as relatives of Jews about anti-Semites, uh, and when we know what anti-Semitism means in Europe and what anti-Semitism means in the Middle East, uh, and what anti-Semitism means when, not, when, when, when someone like Louis Farrakhan gets up in front of a massive audience and says, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm anti-termite, ha, ha, ha. When you, when you take that sense of anti-Semite, someone who actively dislikes Jews, I don't see that in Donald Trump any more than I saw that in the guy in, in the Washington, D.C. Council. I, they, that strikes me not as, not as the poisonous kind of anti-Semitism, but as... The, the sloppy, ignorant boorishness that often strolls into repeating stereotypes because the person saying it is either doesn't know better or doesn't care to know better. I think I think you're being too easy on him, and I I don't know, I don't. But let me say so. I don't know if he's an anti-Semite or not. I have no idea, and I don't try to get in his head. But in my mind, look, President Trump actually has a political strategy. It seems clear to me. Uh, he governs as a partisan. He believes, rightly, we have a very polarized nation, so he will do everything to protect that Republican support. And in the process of doing that, both in 2016 and right now, he is comfortable stirring up uh, organizations and individuals who will tend to be most active and most passionate uh, about voting, about being politically mobilized. Uh, and that goes from very nativist organizations that he is comfortable throwing rhetoric out there. And, and I think he knows exactly what he's doing. And I think similarly with the ad you talked about, or with various statements, I mean, come on, David Duke, you're right. But he actually said he didn't know who he was during the campaign and refused to simply take a stand and say on national television, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Instead, he made a BS statement about his earpiece when he could hear everything else. So I, I think he's strategically doing it. And if he's doing that, whether he personally is anti-Semitic or not, at that point, it's almost irrelevant. What really matters is here's a guy who's president of the United States who's willing to rile up those elements of the electorate. And those ideas, they're hard to contain. Even if I give you the benefit of the doubt and, and he's either being sloppy or he doesn't even believe it, it doesn't matter. Because once he's done that, you can't contain it. And so if there's a pipe bomb sent to George Soros, you know, he had something to do with the path that led us there. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. I agree entirely. I think it's clear to everybody that the thing Donald Trump most believes in is Donald Trump. Yeah. It's not exactly like he's had consistent ideologies through the years. And again, I don't know what's in his head. It doesn't really matter to me. What matters is that he surrounds himself with white nationalists. He props them up. And when he's told, after he says there were very fine people on both sides in Charlottesville, and then he's made to read another statement, and then he goes and takes back his second statement. Right? Or if he uses the word globalists, you would think that once somebody points out that actually that's code for Jews, somebody who's not an anti-Semite would say, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know that. Now, let me, now I'm not going to use that again. But instead, we see him riling up the white nationalists again and again. And that's very different from a city council person who clearly, obviously, has fewer people around him, is less is expected of him, has less experience than the president of the United States. And what you didn't mention is that city council person, actually, since that, um, since that statement, has spent significant time with Jewish groups in DC and has been open to learning. And we haven't seen any of that openness to learning from the President of the United States. Haley? Uh, I agree. Um, I, uh, the fact of the matter is, as I mentioned, uh, anti-Semites see him as one of their own. 
So I think that's what matters here. Anti-Semites, racists, white nationalists, Holocaust deniers, again, they believe they have an ally in him. And that's because he's equivocated. He has not condemned them clearly. He has, he has taken their support. He has said things. He has sent codes in terms of the things he said. Uh, and they feel emboldened and legitimized by the credibility that he has given those movements. Let me um, move off of Trump for a bit. Uh, um, George Bernard Shaw uh, quoted uh, uh, an old line about how uh, the English and the Americans are, are two people separated by a common language. Uh, 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 are American Jews... Yeah, we say anathematized. <laughs> Maybe in Boston you do, but down here we, we can't... There's too many syllables for New Yorkers. Uh, um, are American Jews and Israeli Jews two people separated by a common religion? Uh, uh, in short, um, do most U.S. Jews still feel, you know, a political commonality with Israel? Is it changing, uh, even if it is still most? Uh, I was a Times guy there in the 1990s. I, th I would have felt um, safe to say that, yeah, there was that bond. I'm beginning to wonder if this is still there. But you all are more in touch with this issue than I confess I am right now. Uh, uh, are we living uh, a Jewish version of Mr. Shaw's quote? I don't think there's any question that it's changing. Uh, Israel and Israelis today are in a very different place uh, than they were a generation ago, let alone two generations ago. Israelis know that they live in the most important Jewish community, the largest Jewish community in the world. Um, in Israel, the, you say separated by a common religion. The truth is, for more and more American Jews, maybe even most American Jews, the Jewish religion is of diminishing or non-existent importance. Um, every survey shows that American Jews are the least religious of any, uh, of any demographic in the United States. Um, and um, Jill has mentioned a couple of times polls showing, I don't know what, exactly what poll you, polls are referring to, but just taking it at face value, polls showing that American Jews are, don't support the Netanyahu government, the Netanyahu policies. Clearly the Israeli public does, Israeli Jews right. do. Um, he's the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history and, 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 uh, and Israelis no longer, no longer feel the need to know that American Jews are with them on policy questions. Um, there is nothing at all in Israel and among the Israeli public like the, the anger or distress or, uh, or resentment that many reform and conservative Jews and Jewish organizations in this country feel about certain policies in Israel. It's just not an issue among the Israeli public. Even, even, even among secular Israelis who make up the majority, uh, there is no sense of loyalty for, to, the, to the conservative or the reform movements. Those are all seen as essentially American uh, uh, branches of Judaism that have little relevance to Israeli life. Uh, so much of the, so much of the, of, of the, uh, of the commentary about, from American Jews, you know, you see articles with head titles like, I'm losing my love for Israel. You know, that's one that stuck, sticks in my head from a few years ago. You see more and more of that. I think the, it, there's no question that the, the emotional bond the feeling in your kishkas of, of support and love for Israel uh, that used to be so strong in the American Jewish community uh, is, is weaker now than it's ever been. And while that bothers me, I'm an ardent Zionist. I want, I want all American Jews to love Israel and I want all Americans, you know, I want support for Israel to be, to, to be not only among Republicans but really truly among all Democrats as well. I want it to be across the board, but I know that it's not anymore. Um, uh, I think for a lot of Israelis it just doesn't, matter. There are, they figure that they've got bigger fish to fry, and the Israeli government figures it's got bigger fish to fry than, than worrying over much about what American Jews may think. But it's, I mean, it, it's, I think it will be notable generationally because the previous generation, um, you know, came of age either with the establishment of Israel or the 67 uh, to the uh, Yom Kippur War period, which was uh, very galvanizing if you oh. lived through that. And now we have a generation, if you think of where my students are, uh, I, I was gonna say they're post 
you know, the Intifada, but we're way past that. So they're kind of growing up in this place uh, where politically there's probably a discrepancy with a lot of younger uh, Jews with where the Netanyahu government is, but those issues of the secular world of the United States versus at least a hardening of power uh, uh, for the Orthodox community will probably matter uh, in terms of separating a lot of the new generation from the country. And, and it's also probably not having to do with any of that, and that a lot of younger people now have opportunities to travel, uh, educated, college educates, they're going all over the world, uh, they're moving, uh, there's a lot of movement, and in some ways it might actually diminish the centrality of Israel in that experience for younger uh, Jews. So I think there is going to be a, a huge gulf for all those three reasons. And it might not matter. I mean, in the end, Israelis might not be as worried about that. But for the Jewish community, it seems that it would be a tragedy if that ultimately happens, if that separates. True. So yes, you're right that the paradigm is changing. And certainly the, the paradigm in which the kind of wealthy uncles in America took care of the poor cousins in Israel, that's changing and that's probably a positive. That's not necessarily a healthy paradigm. And it's also true that American Jews in general feel more affinity with Israeli Jews and vice versa. I know some new polling numbers came out about that. I don't know if that was you or somebody else. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but, it, but it's clear that for American Jews, think about Israeli Jews more than Israeli Jews think about American Jews. It's not actually true that Netanyahu is wildly popular in Israel. Um, he would probably win again if elections were held tomorrow. His popularity numbers aren't particularly high. Um, he may be indicted, and there's more a sense of, oh, well, there's nobody else, which I would disagree with, but it's more of that sense than we're in love with him. And it's true that for most Israeli Jews, the, they're not necessarily affiliated with the conservative or reform movement, but there is a lot of anger against the chief rabbinate. There's a lot of anger about, and we see even from people who are politically on the right protests about whether supermarkets can open on Shabbat, for example, about um, hadata, like religification, I don't know how to, what an, a, an English word would be, but the um, infusion or imposition of religion in, in secular public schools. So we, we definitely see that. And one um, phenomenon that I'm starting to experience is, ironically, since both the US and Israel are living under extremist uh, governments, that increasingly progressives in both countries are coming together because we're realizing that it's some of the same phenomena that are happening in both countries. So we have Netanyahu inciting against human rights organizations, attacking the media, um, cuddling up with Orban and other autocrats, and we have Trump here doing the same thing. And so in my experience, I run an, a human rights organization of rabbis, and we have gotten much closer to our Israeli partners over the last couple of years, and the relationship has become much more reciprocal. So instead of it being only about us working on issues there, it's also about our Israeli partners supporting us and recognizing more and more that, in fact, we need to stand together against these larger forces uh, that are moving both countries and many other countries toward a liberal democracy. And it's not only my organization, but I'm hearing that ac across the progressive Jewish world and seeing many progressive Israelis and progressive Americans coming together in that way. Do you want to add to that? No? You OK with that? Um, should there be? A, if you will, in quotes, a Jewish position on immigration, uh, a big issue now, I believe. The book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 9 says, uh, uh, to welcome the stranger, for you were strangers in Egypt. Uh, uh, with that in mind, sh um, should there be, a, if you can, a, a Jewish view on what we're seeing now uh, in regard to immigration, both uh, legal and, and uh, and not legal, uh, and if so, what might that position be? I'll take a stab at it. I don't know that I can tell you that there's a Jewish political position, but I'll tell you how, what I feel in my heart. Uh, I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. My father was the only member of his family who, to come out of Auschwitz alive. Um, how old was he, out of curiosity? How my old? father was in Auschwitz when he was 19 and 20. Uh, he's now, 93 and, sorry to say, declining 
rapidly. Um, well, I think we I can all wish your father to 120, and then we'll figure it out. Thank you. Me. My dad is from Czechoslovakia. He, his family was rounded up in 1944. They were in the far eastern Slovakia, so they were the part of Czechoslovakia that had been given by the Nazis to Hungary. So they were taken with the Hungarian Jews. Uh, and after, the, after liberation came, he was uh, essentially uh, in a coma for months. And when he finally came back to this world, he managed to make his way back to the village that he was from, somehow held body and soul together. He didn't leave Czechoslovakia until 1948 when Czechoslovakia went communist. It was the last of the Eastern European countries to be taken over by the communists. And at that point, he moved heaven and earth and, and, and managed somehow to get himself onto a boat to America. And he, he got here with a, a visa that allowed him to be in the United States for a year as a student. And some years ago, I came across the paperwork that he had filled out when that year was coming to an end. And he wanted to be able to stay in America longer. And reading my dad's words from when he was, at that point, 22 or 23 years old, explaining to US officials, I have nothing, there's nothing for me back in Europe. My family was wiped out by the Nazis. Now the communists have taken over my country. Uh, there's nothing for me there. I, I will die if I go back. Uh, and I never actually have been able to track down the paperwork where you know they stamped the approval that he could stay, but it happened, and five years later, he became a citizen and shortened his name from Yakubovich to Jacobi. Uh, so for me, immigration is not only a Jewish issue, but it's very, a very deep personal issue. Uh, and so what, and should, I, and, what should the attitude be toward these people arriving from what the president describes as uh, uh, excrement-filled countries? My, I'll, I'll not use the word here. One of the first columns that I ever wrote at the Boston Globe, I've been writing for the columns for the Globe now since 1994. One of the first columns I ever wrote was during the Haitian boat refugee crisis during the Clinton administration. And the Clinton administration was having these people who were desperately fleeing Haiti rounded up and sent back. And one of the first columns I ever wrote was headlined, Let the Haitians In. Under Democratic administrations and under Republican administrations, under Democratic uh, uh, majority Congresses and Republican majority Congresses, my attitude has always been, this is a huge country and it grows stronger and healthier and more vibrant the more people are allowed to come into this country. I understand security concerns and financial concerns and all the rest of it, and I think that there are ways of dealing with all of them, but my general attitude has always been the more the merrier. I want there to be the most robust, welcoming immigration possible. So whether it's uh, you know, the, the, the so-called caravan of people coming up from Honduras, or whether it was the boat people coming from Haiti, I can't stand it when I see American <coughs> officials and American presidents and, and American politicians rear up on their hind legs and say that we have too many people, we right. don't want low-skilled people, uh, they're just coming for the welfare, and all the other uh, slurs that are constantly made about Democrats, uh, made about immigrants. Right. And you hear it made by Democrats, and you hear it made by Republicans, and there's a certain hypocrisy in the vehement attacks, all of which I agree with, uh, on, on the Trump administration policy toward immigration. There's a certain hypocrisy in the fact that it's being made by Democrats who just a few years ago were voicing exactly the same kind of sentiments when they thought that it was gonna be politically useful for them. Hillary Clinton was adamant in talking about how she didn't want illegal immigrants coming into the country. Right. From, from Chuck Schumer to Dianne Feinstein, they all said it. So if there, is there a Jewish attitude? You talk about love the stranger. Uh, there's a passage in the Talmud where one of the, one of the rabbis says, that while it only says you have to love your fellow, you have to love your neighbor, your fellow as yourself, it only says that once. There are, he says, 32 places where it says one way or another that you have to love the stranger. And the Talmud being what the Talmud is, you know, a big book of arguments, immediately another rabbi comes along and says, no, 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 it's 42 places. Okay. So if there's a Jewish approach to immigration, I know this is a long-winded answer, you could tell you know, how, how deeply it, it goes with me. If there's a Jewish attitude on immigration, uh, I would say it's the attitude that we welcome strangers when they come to our borders, as long as they're coming with peaceful intentions uh, and, and not coming to, to do anything except to improve their own lives. Uh, my attitude is always, let's find a way to let them in. Haley, what do you think? Um, um, 
So I will also uh, invoke memories of my father. Uh, so in 1987, my father took me on a bus to Washington, D.C. to join the, perhaps some of you were there, the March for Soviet yep. Jewry. I was there too. Uh, I have images of myself uh, on my father's shoulders and signs, Gorbachev, let my people go. And it was only later that I really learned why I was there, and that was about the values that my parents wanted to impart on me, to serve as a voice for those who are silenced, and to ensure that everybody has the same kind of freedoms that we enjoy. That wasn't just about the emigration of Soviet Jews. That was about Jewish values. So when I see the kind of policies of this administration, and let's go back to January of 2017, when this administration contrived an immigration policy that explicitly discriminated against Muslims. They looked at a religion. Specifically, they looked at Muslim-majority countries, and they excluded refugees coming from those countries based on religion. Those are against our values. Those are against the values that I was taught and the values that were imparted on me. So it wasn't just this caravan. It's also the separation of families at our borders, the, uh, the tearing children away. I mentioned it earlier. This, I believe, is antithetical to Jewish values. The way this administration has handled immigration, whether it's discrimination based on religion or just having no, no, um, no empathy whatsoever to those in need fleeing, whether they're coming from Central and South America or whether they're coming from Muslim-majority countries, they're coming here for a reason, and we should not close our borders to those in need, certainly not based on the kind of discrimination we have heard articulated by this administration and by the president. Have you seen the video? <laughs> have, have, have you seen, you, you should all go look on YouTube at some point and look for this video of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush Sr. Uh, George H.W. Bush, when they were running, both running in 1980 for the Republican nomination, and they were in a, at a debate somewhere in, in Texas. And a, somebody gets up from the audience and says, do you think that people who come into this country illegally should be entitled to be educated at taxpayer expense? If you want the, the, the most perfect example of how a party can do a 180 degree change, you should look at the answers that were given to that question by Ronald Reagan and, and, and the senior George Bush. Ronald Reagan called for open borders between Mexico and the United States. He said we should have open borders so that those who want to come into this country and want to come here and work should be free to do so, and we can go over there. It's a completely different tone. And uh, I mean, I, I hope you will agree with me that your, your Jewish values are as offended when Democrats, when Barack Obama is referred to as the deporter in chief because his administration was <coughs> setting new records for the number of people being turned away, as you are by anything that's so, happening just there to now. respond, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I do not agree at all that Barack Obama ever instituted an immigration policy that explicitly they explicitly discriminated against refugees coming in based on religion, which is what our courts believe this administration did and tried to do and tried to do until finally they found a court that would allow it. Jill, Julian? Well, it's clear that immigration is a Jewish value, and we know that, for one thing, Jews consistently support more liberal immigration policy in every poll, including the one that you just did. Second, you already referenced the Torah, right? So the, the word ger in the Torah is, doesn't have a precise translation, but it's essentially somebody who came from one place and is more or less permanently at another place, probably never heading back to where they, they came from, and they are structurally vulnerable, and of course there's obligations toward them. And God, in giving the command, or at least one of the times when God gives the command that we have to care for the, the ger, one of the explanations is because we ourselves were gerim in, in Egypt. Right. And the implication is, look, you were in this position, right? the, the term, it's not like some people are born as gayrim and some people are not, it's, um, it's situational. So you were in this situation and I, God, took care of you in that situation and I'm always gonna take care of the, I'm always gonna take the side of the gayr no matter whether it's you or somebody else. Um, the second thing I'd mention is that the sin of Sodom, of the evil city of Sodom, according to the Talmud, is that they decided to not allow wayfarers to come through and actually instituted laws prohibiting 
taking care of feeding any strangers who came to town. So that's the most evil example of a city that we have, and that was their sin, not some of the other things that people may think was, was their sin. This and week's the, Parsha, by the way. I think I'm now absolved from going to shul this Shabbat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And the last thing I want to say, sometimes people in the Jewish community falsely say, oh, well, my family came here legally. And of course, we know that that's not true, because before 1924, my, fam my family came at the turn of the century. So before we totally agree on that. I know, so we totally right. agree. Um, right before 1924, there, was, there wasn't legal or illegal immigration. Then, of course, in 1924, a law that was passed was specifically to keep Jews and a few others out of the country. And we know the disastrous consequences of that. And the, the very last thing, I'll just say, one of the other ways that we know that this is clearly a Jewish issue is that the response I've seen to immigration among the rabbinic community and their communities is like nothing else. So we've had mass arrests of rabbis around immigration. People have never gotten arrested before. We took three delegations this summer to the border, including one to San Diego of more than 30 rabbis who went to San Diego with less than a week's notice. And usually if you call rabbis and say, can you go to X, Y, and Z, they'll say, let me check my calendar for the next two years. But with less than a week's notice, they were willing to show up. And that shows Great. how personally we take this issue in our community. Julian was taking notes. I know he has something no, no, serious to say. Just a few thoughts. First, even with, with the Republican Party changing, even George uh, W. Bush, you can look at, uh, I, I edited a book on him, and someone wrote a chapter. It's kind of amazing where he was on immigration, in part because of his own experience uh, in Texas. Very yeah, close huge to Hispanic like, support. Yeah, it, personally, as governor, it really, you can see a pretty uh, big shift that's taken place in the last few years in the party. So it's interesting. You don't even have to go back to Reagan. You can go uh, much shorter time frame. It is hard to square uh, a nativist position with both the Jewish experience and Jewish values. Uh, I, I think everyone has said that from, from the experience, obviously, of early 20th century immigration uh, or the Holocaust to the fact we are literally a moving people uh, throughout our history. Um, it's hard to kind of put that together with a, a very different look at who should come in the borders. And then you add to it the theology, the values, the question I guess I would have, though, uh, to throw it back, if there should be a Jewish perspective on immigration uh, as opposed to a broader perspective. And I, I was just looking at these letters in Heschel's papers where he wanted to uh, put an ad in the New York Times against the Vietnam War, and he asked all these prominent Jewish leaders and thinkers to sign this advertisement. It included oh. authors, it included rabbis, it included university presidents. And he kind of made these kinds of arguments with relation to war. And he got a fierce response privately. Many very liberal Jews who agreed with him said, that's not what has, you can't start going that way. You don't want a Jewish response uh, to a bad war, a Jewish response to a bad problem. It, it ultimately has to be an interfaith response. It has to be uh, part of a, a broader coalition. Otherwise, you segment how you even think of the concept. And, and for me, uh, while I am 100% sympathetic to everything, I, I think it's also simply part of the American tradition, uh, a, a, a kind of liberal immigration. Right. And it's important that uh, Jewish Americans who are in that place continue to form those alliances, um, because it really is quite integral to a lot of what the country has been about. I have a ton of questions, but I would like to begin to throw it to the audience. Uh, uh, I, I think we got a few hands maybe the, raised. Maybe the house lights could be turned up so we can um, see the, the faces. Lights. I need Judy. I also might just want to throw in that I myself am the son of a father who is uh, an illegal immigrant. So, uh, 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 from where? From uh, what, when he was born, was the dying embers of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, showing my age. Uh, and um, under present yardsticks, uh, uh, he definitely came from one of those countries that are undesirable and uh, in certain ways, and uh, I probably wouldn't exist. Um, that's another issue. Um, yes, sir, and the one thing that I have up here that you don't is the right 
to cut off questions that go on interminably. Uh, uh, I hope to do it gently, but please, questions, not, not speeches. At the ceremony for the opening of the American Embassy, there was not one Democrat in the delegation. Maybe that's because there were no Republican senators or congressmen who were Jewish, as, as I, I Cantor, I think, was the last one. But the ceremony was opened by a fundamentalist Christian and closed by a fundamentalist Christian. I think Hagee was one of those people. I want you to talk about the marriage of convenience between the fundamentalist Christians and the Jews. I think David Harris said you've got to go along with it for as long as you can to get by the current. Is, is, is that marriage uh, viable and what should it be? Interesting question. It's a good question. And a lot when, when you, uh, a lot of Republican support for Israel has stemmed from strong support in the evangelical community. and. The opening of the embassy was stunning on both fronts. Uh, to see that, I think it's pretty uh, explicit why and logical why. I don't think that's the basis of a durable alliance um, because uh, evangelical Christians have very different sets of concerns in the long term, will have different political agendas. And, and I think if that becomes the measure, uh, for being pro-Israel, uh, I, I don't think that's a good, a good path to go down. I don't think it's the measure, but I'll tell you, all due respect, I think there's a lot of bigotry against Christians, especially evangelical Christians, on the part of American Jews. Uh, I, I have had the, the pleasure and the privilege many times of, of speaking to and listening to and breaking bread with evangelical Christians who are pro-Israel, and I'll tell you, I hear so often from American Jews, oh, the only reason they're pro-Israel is because, and then they start ticking off uh, 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 you know, different uh, ulterior motives. Oh, they believe that this is gonna bring the second coming, or they, you know, they've got all kinds of uh, uh, rationales. Um, it happens to be real. It, it, it does not happen to be real, and when you talk to evangelical Christians, what comes across over and over and over again, in fact, again, uh, <laughs> talking about parsons, this is, you know, this past, uh, Torah reading, over and over and over again, I have heard evangelical Christians quote to me uh, Genesis 12, verse th chapter 12, verse 3, God saying to, to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And the first 50 times I heard it, I thought, okay, they're just spinning me. But after you hear it 100 times or 150 times or 250 times, coming from people who show no sign what, whatever that there's anything but genuine heartfelt emotion. They believe that it's their duty as Christians to support Jews, however, however that's defined, to support the Jewish state, to love the Jewish people. I've heard it so many times and I, I, I'm long past the point where I think that there's anything cynical about it. Uh, I, I, I love telling the story about the time I got a phone call. I'd written a column that was supporting Israel on something or other and the phone rang and on the other end was a woman with this heavy Louisiana accent. And she said, I, she was calling to encourage me not to weaken in my support for Israel. So I told her, you don't have to worry about that. She said, I want you to know, and she lived in, didn't live in New Orleans. She lived in some small, small town in, in the Bayou area. She said, I have two flagpoles in front of my house. And one of them, I fly the stars and stripes. And on the other one, I fly the flag of Israel. I raise those flags every morning. And I thank God every, every day that there's a state of Israel in my world. You hear comments like that, and I just find it so dispiriting when the response from so many American Jews is, oh, this is, it isn't sincere, or, or they really look down on us, or they want all the Jews to be uh, disappeared in the rapture, or all these kinds of strange theological justifications that Jews who don't believe any of the, the Christian theology will give uh, for the, to explain why it is that evangelicals support, uh, support Israel. You know, I remember during the, the second intifada, 2000, 2001, 2002, when Jewish organizations all over America were canceling their trips that to is Israel. True. Evangelical Christians increased the number of tour groups that they were sending. It was evangelical Christians from America who at that point almost single-handedly sustained the Israeli tourist economy. There's a tremendous amount of love, and if there are theological differences between Jews and Christians, you know, that's, that's not news. We've known that for 2,000 years. Uh, I would just say don't interpret evangelical Christians' expressions of support for Israel as a, as a secret form of hostility. I'm gonna take, Jill, very quickly, I wanna, I wanna take more questions. Okay, yeah. I wanna actually take it in a different direction, though I, I will say that I'm not that interested in being part of somebody's supersessionist fantasy, but 
Um, the alliance with the evangelicals has led to some really strange situations. In particular, we've seen the Orthodox Union side with evangelicals on issues of birth control and abortion, which is very strange because what Judaism says about birth control and abortion is quite different from what um, more conservative Christianity says, including sometimes even mandating birth control or abortion cases, certainly where a mother's life is in danger. And that means that the OU has taken some positions that could potentially put an Orthodox woman or a non-Orthodox woman in a position in which she wasn't able to do what her Jewish legal obligation is. And that's just a sort of very strange bedfellows for this prize of being aligned on Israeli politics. Mm. Um, we had a question here. Yeah. Let me uh, express my opposite views what I heard tonight. It's unbelievable. Presently, Israel in 70 years did not have a stronger support in Washington, D.C. Nikki Haley, John Bolton, uh, Mike Huckabee, uh, you name it, they never had such a support. And uh, that's one thing. What I haven't heard talking to you about, the, the anti-Semitism in camp, US campuses. That's something that has to be addressed. L let's not uh, emphasize uh, um, uh, Donald Trump is anti-Semite. How could he be anti-Semite when, when he has his daughter converted and right. he is supporting Israel, he's allowing everything uh, taking, taking place. So the, and right now Israel is so isolated. Is there a question? Well, I have to. Well, you have to listen to what I have to say. No. Because, yeah, yes. That's why we are a democratic society to listen to other other so. sir i'm sorry uh, so you i are said sorry. From, i said from, i'm sorry too <laughs> i said from the beginning and uh, i'm taking and I'm, I'm telling you one what's that uh, please please let's no, keep okay. this let's keep this civil please hand over the microphone yeah, but, do you have a question well, the I have not heard a question, well, the, the, you and, and there are people here who have it, questions. It hurts you are, you are here. Okay, the question that I'll interpret, if I may, is what about anti-Semitism on campus? Uh, is it worrisome, uh, or is it uh, another passing phenomenon? I think we really talked about this when we talked about I think about we did, quite frankly, but uh, I'll give you that, that question briefly, if we may. I think it got, kind of got downplayed. Anti-Semitism on many college campuses is terrible, and it's worse than it's been, certainly in, in, in my lifetime, when you have professors who were refusing to write letters of recommendation for their students because the student wants to go and, and do a, a graduate program in Israel, when you have pro-Israel student groups that have their signs uh, torn up and their, and their uh, displays knocked over by uh, you know, Jewish Voices for Peace or, or Students for Justice in Palestine or, or, or any of these other anti-Semitic organizations. It, it's outrageous what, what Jewish students on campus are forced to contend with. Some, some sure. of the most wonderful organizations in American Jewish life are the ones that work hard to, to fortify Jewish students so that they know what to say, how to respond, how to conduct themselves when they, when they encounter this kind of thing. On something like, I don't 200, more than 200 college campuses, every year there's a so-called Israel Apartheid Week. Some campuses, Boston University a few years ago, had two weeks of it. I guess one week of, of defaming Israel wasn't enough. They had to do it for two weeks. So I, 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 I don't think there's any question that there's a lot of anti-Semitism on college campuses. It's, it's, it's not the only thing that's going wrong in higher education, but it's a very visible sign. And you know the way we talk about anti-Semitism and, and really ugly anti-Zionism, anti anti-Israel hostility as a kind of canary in the coal mine for problems in the larger environment. I think that's a classic example. I, I Julian, must you're, say, you're I have a different perspective. It is there, and I don't, you know, every incident I will condemn, and there are students who do, the, the, the letter writing was an example of one, on all university campuses. So maybe there will be more, but we shouldn't take that as representative. There are student groups who do that, and there should be no tolerance. I do think, personally, it's, I think it's a mistake to, there are many Jewish left-wing students uh, who are involved in, in it's not anti versus pro-Israel all the time. There's legitimate critics of Israel, supporters of Israel, and my fear, honestly, in the same way you like 
groups that prepare students is that we freeze healthy debate on the campuses. I think I want Jewish students on both sides to feel comfortable uh, not to be tagged as anti or pro-Israel, but as thinking about what should Israeli policy be. What should, and, and, and the way it's characterized, I think it's, I think it's scaring students. I don't think it's the right way to do it. I think a lot, there's vigorous debate. That's what college is often about, and I don't think it's all anti semitic Julie, don't you think that there's a problem when, for example, an Israeli ambassador can't appear on, a, on an American college campus without having to have a massive yeah. security presence paid for because there are threats of violence? No, Is that a problem? A absolutely. There's nothing. There's also a problem when organizations, student organizations, who want to have legitimate criticism of what's going on also feel frozen out on campus. It's a terrible culture. Both sides. That is a both sides. Agreed. We're, we're replicating a we bad have, situation. We have a question over there. Good evening. My name is Shana Gursky. I come with a question from the Brooklyn Young Democrats. I am an outside organizer. I help out with the Jewish caucus. This is directed at everybody on the panel. Thank you for coming. You're very interesting. Question is, how has the Jewish community dealt with prominent anti-Semitic influential figures in the past as in affiliating, being truly connected to people in power? And how can we use and update those strategies for today's political climate, particularly um, the president of BYD asked about Louis Farrakhan. Thank you. I just want to compliment you on the way you asked that question. <laughs> Okay. I think, look, Jewish... Uh, Let's work, not go too uh, far back in the past, no, no, by the very, way. Look, this, is, this has happened. Uh, Jewish organizations, certainly post-World War II, organizations have been pretty mobilized when this happens. Uh, it, it, it has actually been a place in which the Jewish community here in the United States has responded. Uh, they have put pressure on other politicians, certainly not to tolerate that. And in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when Jewish organizations were part of a broad civil rights coalition, this was always uh, an issue. There was no toleration for a George Wallace, for example, or Southern politicians who would, toy, who would kind of use this kind of rhetoric. Uh, and I don't know if there's any other secret. It, it, it's quite important, and that gets back to the opening of this conversation, uh, to, to respond, to be vocal, to be politically mobilized, and not to sit quietly if this emerges in mainstream American politics. And, and that was the response. It's like any other issue in terms of mobilizing to make sure it goes away. I'm going to move up there. The gentleman has his hand up. I guess we're going to have time for two or three more questions. It, it's heartwarming to have a sense that as Jews, we are immune to the virus of uh, nativism. But there was one aspect of the conversation tonight that did bother me a little bit, and that was that by, there were like, what, over 800 candidates for uh, Congress this year, and one side notes that there are three Democrats that are very anti-Israel, if not anti-Semitic, and the other side notes that there are like nine Holocaust uh, deniers and other anti-Semites on the Republican side. And I wonder if we are being, if we're losing sight of the importance of two major parties, which are still relatively moderate and have a stake in the future, and, and that we have a stake in, in the future of those two parties, and that we resist the kind of almost Weimar-like uh, polarization that could just undermine the center. Um, anybody want to take that? Um, no, I'll just, Haley? I'll be brief. Um, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, However, um, I think Donald Trump is anything but moderate. And, well, you can't actually separate him from the Republican Party. He's the president. And those Republicans in Congress, you know, some have spoken out and they're leaving Congress. Others have spoken out and they're berated on Twitter. Uh, and, you know, the rest of them are silent and complicit. So they're anything but moderate. I'll, I'll give a slightly different answer. 
I think you're right to say that the, the broad center, the broad mainstream of both parties, like the broad mainstream of American society generally, uh, by definition, it is not spoken for by the extremes on either side. But bad ideas have a way of seeping toward the mainstream, into the mainstream, from the extremes. Um, uh, it would have been unthinkable, I mean, since, since Haley is here speaking up for the Democrats, I'll just you know, give, give a nudge in the other direction. It would have been unthinkable 16 years ago for Israeli flags to be burned outside of a Democratic National Convention while a Palestinian flag is being hoisted inside the Democratic National Convention, which happened at the, at the, at the DNC uh, in, in 2016. Uh, it, it's, it's an illustration of how ideas that would have once been anathematized by the, 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 the center of a party gradually have a way of, of becoming more and more normal. You know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan famously talked about defining deviancy down, and it, this applies in a thousand different ways, not just when it comes to Jewish issues, not just when it comes to Israel, not just when it comes to anti-Semitism, in, kinds of, in, in all kinds of ways, ideas that at first people are tempted to think, oh, that's never gonna happen, only crackpots believe that. Bit by bit, bit by bit, you know, Weimar is a good example you, 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 you reference. Bit by bit, it, it, it moves more and more into the mainstream. And I think as Jews who his, have this historical memory of finding ourselves uh, in, in, you know, in, 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 one, in, in one time and place, comfortable and, and secure, suddenly realizing that, you know, that it's just quicksand underneath our feet, there's just this feeling that bad ideas may only be held by three or four or seven or nine candidates out of 800 who are running, but that's still something to be concerned about. Um. I'd like to move further up. Uh, oh, you have, already have the microphone. That takes care of that. Um, I'm a bit nervous just as a general, as I am as a person, so I'm sorry if I stutter while asking this uh, question. But uh, one thing that I think you guys kind of touched upon that uh, maybe you didn't explore uh, too well is that um, Donald Trump, in my opinion, has done three things that can be perceived as pro-Israel, three major things that could be perceived as pro-Israeli, you know, try pro-Jewish. Actions. One is leaving the UN Human Rights Council over the fact that Israel has more human rights violations than every, every other country in the world combined, including countries like North Korea and Saudi right. Arabia. Another is obviously the moving of the um, embassy from Tel Aviv right. to uh, Jerusalem, and then there's the leaving the Iran deal. Um, given the extreme partisan nature that exists in the um, uh, country in this day and age, could these perceived um, actions that he's taken be um, lead to more divisions um, in regards to, like, Democrats, uh, as you briefly kind of touched upon, are slightly, there's a slight percentage of them that are becoming more and more anti-Israel, but since Trump is doing these things that are meant to be pro-Israel and because of how partisan the country is, there are going to be people upset at anything Trump does, it's going to cause those tensions to kind of increase, so to say. Do you, so do you think that there's any kind of influence like that or how, if that's a big factor in, like, maybe driving up further partisan, um, you know, kind of uh, a angst against Israel? And well, I think the first we have to separate those issues from being pro-Israel. And I don't want to dive into each of those issues and analyze them, but um, one can certainly be pro-Israel and not agree with the Trump policy in those. And in fact, I haven't seen polling about the first. I don't know if there has been. But on the, the second two, the majority of American Jews did not agree with the decision to move the embassy and did not agree with the decision to drop out of the Iran deal, which um, actually most American Jews thinks that, think that that keeps Israel safer. That deal would keep Israel safer. Um, so I just want to, again, <laughs> separate out those policies from what it means to be pro-Israel, because there's lots of arguments about what it means to be pro-Israel, just like there's lots of arguments about what it means to be pro-America. Um, and we've seen the, the polling, I and mean, Haley could talk more about the polling, but we've seen the polling over and over that, in fact, the Jewish support for Israel is not really changing in general, um, and that Jews are able to understand that criticizing the current government is different from that, and that the um, still the vast majority, 74% of Jews, are planning to vote Democratic in this in this election. So I don't see a shift at all. Yeah, just to just to put a finer point on it, 70% uh, of those polled uh, disapproved of President Trump's decision to walk away from the Iran deal. And just to know, I mean, we now have no 
Iran deal in terms of no, uh, no certification of whether Iran could be making a nuclear weapon. I mean, in, there is nothing. He didn't try to replace it with anything. He just walked away with nothing. So 70% of Jews disapproved of that, and 56% of those polled disapprove with the, uh, with the moving of the embassy. It's not that they didn't see Jerusalem as the capital, but they disapproved of the way he moved the embassy. Israel is not simply about territory. It isn't. It's about values. It's about religious ideas. It's about an uh, entire community of peoples. And uh, I think it's a mistake to kind of uh, categorize him as simply pro-Israel. It's obvious when I think part of, uh, at least some of us are saying, it's, it's more complex exactly what he stands for. And if you agree with some of what we're saying about who he allies with himself here in the United States. If it's true, uh, and I do believe it, that he's comfortable having groups, white nationalist groups in his orbit, he's not pro-Israel. The two don't go hand in hand. I do think it might harden a, a kind of a different kind of part of it. I do think this will intensify some of the just political divisions. It might not affect the vote, but within the Jewish community, which have um, already been growing. Jeff, I, 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 Jeff, think, Jeff? I think you put your finger on a real problem. The fact that Trump does X will mean that some people will be more vehemently anti-X just because it's Trump who's doing it. Uh, I, I can think of specific individuals in the media, for example, who, who, who favored policies until Trump came out in favor of them and have gradually moved against it. So I, I think there really is a concern. The fact that he's identified himself very strongly with, let's say, moving the embassy will lead at least some number of people to say, therefore moving the embassy must be a bad idea. And uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure that it's as, that the have, views I'm are already afraid, as big as they were. I have to, we, I'm afraid it's getting late and there's a kiddish afterwards uh, <laughs> that I'm sure a lot of you want to go to. Uh, so we have time for one more question. I know there are a lot of hands. I'm sorry? Well, okay. All right. Two more questions. Yours, sir, and then a woman. Oh. And it could be here or there. there. I, I guarantee you this was not done with malice or forethought. Uh, but, but, but there's a, a woman here who wants to ask a question and a woman here. I didn't realize we were gonna, this was gonna become a gender issue, but since it has, uh, we'll take two more questions, but it's gonna keep you from the kiddish. Um, there, there are very clear divisions in this election and in the Republican versus Democratic Party. Uh, that are only being exacerbated. Women are moving Democrat, men are moving Republican. Same with age and same with urban versus exurban. Do you think those relate similarly in the Jewish community or do you think the Jewish community is somewhat more unique demographically where they don't fit into those neat boxes that the Nate Silvers and Nate Cones of the world are drawing? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I just quick answer from my, I'm not sure you'll see that kind of movement from uh, Jewish voters who I still think will remain primarily democratic. Uh, maybe the feeling will intensify because of partly what you're saying a reaction to, uh, but I don't think you're gonna see dramatic shifts. Small segments of the Jewish community, but not big, not big shifts. Last question here. Uh, yes, I, I noticed that this, this, this platform is, is uh, focusing on the federal level. And um, what we have here in New York and maybe in other states is also uh, municipal and state elections. And there's, uh, there's a lot of um, focus on um, the uh, ultra-Orthodox Jewish organizations. Um, and I, I don't only say ultra-Orthodox Jewish because other extremist organizations are there as well. So. Um, however, there's a lot of focus there on, on the corruption and on the um, infringement of separation of church and state. And I'm just wondering, you know, when we're talking about uh, how, how it affects the overall possible anti-Semitism, those, uh, those that have unenlightened, more unenlightened views are going to broad stroke it against all Jews when they see um, organizations like that that vote 
uh, in blocks, according to what their Rebbe says. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing any of that or what your feelings are, because in New York, especially with our educational system and the infringement, like I said, on separation of church and state, there's a lot of corruption going on there. Interesting I mean, question, yeah. actually. The question, uh, basically, not everybody heard it, is uh, we've been focused, of course, on the national level for the most part. But there are local issues, including, uh, if I'm getting uh, your question correctly, support uh, of various uh, religious institutions, I guess. And, and of course, specifically, we're talking about uh, ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic, uh, Haredi, depending on, on what you prefer, uh, and, and how that plays out. And to some degree, with that creative, again, if I'm reading you right, something of a backlash. Uh, uh, against that sort of uh, uh, practice. I, I, I could add that um, it's certainly an issue here in New York where uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, has been courting the, uh, the Hasidic uh, uh, community quite assiduously and has been raising uh, eyebrows in some circles as to whether or not he is uh, incorrectly using uh, municipal funds to help support religious institutions. I think I've encapsulated it correctly. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what we have been talking about in general has been um, state, I, I mean, there's not a, a federal election happening right now, right? So we're talking about state races, but New York, I don't know that we can go into all the intricacies of New York Jewish politics, which right. are quite complicated as, as we know, and particularly, I think some of the issues that you're referring to are questions about how much um, yeshivot have to uh, follow a secular curriculum and ensure that kids get a secular education, issues about funding. There's, yes, there have been some um, corruption issues. There's lots of issues we go into, but it doesn't break down along the, it doesn't break down along Republican Democratic lines, um, certainly not in New York. Um, and could there be a backlash? Is there a backlash? Yes, of course. Uh, when people see identifiable Jews acting in a certain way, there certainly is sometimes uh, often an anti-Semitic backlash. And I think we have to be able to separate the issues from the people to be able to say this X, Y, or Z is, is wrong and that doesn't say anything at all about Jews or about Orthodox Jews, Haredi Jews. I mean, all groups employ block power in different ways. And you can go into any state or city and find that my guess is those who want to be anti-Semitic will find reasons to be anti-Semitic. And I'm not sure kind of that example or examples like that will uh, add to their passion. They're ready to go. So um, I'm not sure that would be a, a causal effect. Uh, it's really interesting, though, to break into the state and local politics and see how there some of the partisan divisions look very different um, when you're talking about old-fashioned, almost machine power politics. Um, not surprisingly, at a Jewish gathering, we've gone over the allotted time. Uh, there are many questions. I'm sorry we couldn't take everyone, but it's obviously not possible. But again, there is a reception afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.